Thank you very Thank you very much. <laughs> you see, tradition, tradition. That's a tradition that cannot be broken. And so that without further ado, <laughs> I bring to you <laughs> Rick Stone. Rick, I don't know if you want to prefer everybody to call you Richard, Rick, or Richard as long Stone. as they don't call you late for dinner. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I answered all kinds of names. So thank you for having me, uh, uh, Mark. And it's it's really great to be with all of you. I I've gotten to know a lot of you just through through your pictures on Saturday mornings, but a uh, few of you are people I've gotten to know a little better. My friend Haiti and Yumi here, uh, whom I've known for 40 years, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it could be that long. Yeah. So I want to share with you this evening uh, work that is, for me, the culmination of uh, over 30 years of working with storytelling. And, um, and my journey with story has gone through lots of different avenues. And, uh, uh, and so I, I'm going to focus on in one particular area, which I think is most relevant for us and is a great follow up off to your presentation last week, which is how do we make meaning uh, out of our lives and, and, and what is our legacy and how do we do that? And I think it'll be a, a good adjunct to many of the things that you shared with us. Um, and hopefully it'll give you some new tools uh, that, that you maybe have not ever considered before. So I'm gonna share my screen. And what I'd like to do, um, Mark's gonna kind of keep an eye on chat. And uh, I wanna make this a conversation, not just a presentation. We're also gonna make it interactive. We're gonna have some breakthrough rooms, two to three of them, see how we're doing time-wise. So that we'll have some fun and we'll give you a chance to try out some of these ideas and these concepts, but actually do them. Uh, but if you have a comment, you got a question, uh, raise your hand, and uh, we'll we'll make it uh, we'll make it a, a dialogue, not a monologue. Um, so let me. Oops. Can you guys see that? Yeah, the PowerPoint. Great. So so we're we're going to be talking about story intelligence and the power of story to help us create meaning, and uh, and to live with greater purpose and a greater sense of uh, connection with our lives. And um, so, uh, you know, it's just a little way of introduction. So most of you don't know me very well, uh, but I've been mucking around with story for a long time. Uh, written a few books on story. Um, uh, I've uh, created a board game called Pitch a Story back in the, in the, in the early 2000s. I've actually created some products in the healthcare arena that uh, are reliant on story. We'll spend a little time to looking at living stories today, which is a program I created for Novant Healthcare in North Carolina. Um, have a performance called The Magad, which is really, really built on and based on a story that Reb Zaman told me 25 years ago <laughs> or more that percolated for me a long time and turned into a screenplay and then turned into a one-man performance. And then uh, most recently, the book Story Intelligence which uh, just came out uh, this about, about a year ago and really is the culmination of um, really a lifetime of work with story and what I've learned. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about us and who we are as human beings. And, and I, I think that, um, that, that humans and, the power and story evolve together in a stair-step fashion, is that I don't think we can talk about what it means to be a human being without talking about story. And I don't think we can talk about story without talking about what it means to be a human being. And I think that human beings uh, brains evolved uh, in a stair step fashion with storytelling. And, and, and there's a lot of research that's coming out now that would substantiate that. So I think we've had uh, we've had sort of three uh, neuro narrative revolutions in, in, in humankind. And, and the first you know, took place hundreds of thousands of years ago when people started sharing stories about their experiences with each other. And uh, they weren't just sort of rudimentary communications, they became narratives and stories. And some of those are chronicled on the walls of caves on every continent. And I think these were the first PowerPoints. <laughs> people were, 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 were teaching with these cave drawings, you know, how not to get crushed by a woolly mammoth or what would happen, you know, if a, a, a neighboring tribe attacks and, how do you survive that? And, and how do you deal with, uh, with maybe scarcity of resources? So we were, we've been telling stories for a long time orally. Um, and, and, and you know what's so interesting about this is that uh, 
you know, that's still fundamental, you know, and if we think about the Jewish tradition, you know, it started out as an oral tradition, you know, before it was ever written down, these things were being told orally and, and oh, you know, it's in, and it's a blip in time that we've been reading, <laughs> you know, the Gutenberg press was just, was just invented 500 or so years ago. Certainly people were scribing before that, but it was a very, very small percentage of people, you know, who, who were reading and suddenly, suddenly we started reading. There's a fabulous story uh, in, in Plato's Phaedrus. Uh, there are there are two. Uh, there's the god uh, Thuth, who is the god of creation, and, and Famous, who is sort of like the good housekeeping seal of approval guy. And uh, so Thuth came to Famous one day, all excited because he he had, he'd invented writing. And it was going to be a great boon for humankind to have writing. Isn't this wonderful? We'll, we'll never forget anything, and we'll have it all all recorded. And and and, and famous uh, contemplate this for a moment. He says, "Well, my friend Thuth, actually, the opposite is the case. Once we write it down, we'll have no reason to remember it." And I think that there's really a, a case to be made: is that we've lost something by losing the oral tradition. We don't sit around telling stories any longer on front porches or gathering around, you know, central fires, you know, for long nights in the winter to tell stories. And we have lost a capacity. And uh, I knew a Scottish storyteller I was teaching in Wales a number of years ago, and he was there at the program with me. And he knew over 3,000 stories and ballads. That's just remarkable, you know, and he could just, you know, he just, just could not, they were in his memory. Most of us can't remember where we put our keys, you know, last night, you know, uh, we can't even remember that. So, and, and now we're, we're involved in a very different neuro narrative revolution. And it has to do with these screens that we deal with all the time, you know, and our, our iPhones and, and, and stories are being told on YouTube and all these other vehicles. Uh, we don't know what that's doing to our brains, but I think it's actually impacting young people's brains in some interesting ways that uh, are maybe positive. Uh, I've got a, a colleague of mine, his son is a top gun in the Air Force, and he was a he was a whiz on computer games. And so for him to move into flying airplanes and be able to do all the kinds of, you know, high, you know, you know, kind of coordination, it was a natural for him. But um, I think our attention spans are, are decreasing. We know that for a fact uh, that we're we're uh, we're we're not able to attend to a, a long story. People want it quick. If it's not ten or fifteen seconds, you know, we've got to move on to the next thing, and that's affecting our brains in some interesting ways. You know, back in the 1600s, Descartes declared, "I think, therefore I am," and this is the way we defined ourselves up until not too long ago that we define ourselves through uh, our, our brains and how our, our thinking brains and our intellect. Uh, and it's no surprise that uh, about 100 years later, a guy named Carl Linnaeus came along and he named us as, as a species, homo sapiens, wise humans. Um, and, and that's how we've thought about ourselves for this, this length of time. But, um, you know, a, a lot of that's changing, you know, so we, we had to focus on logical reasoning pretty much in the 20th century and, you know, Albert Einstein was sort of the kind of the uh, epitome of that, you know, uh, the brainy guy. And we thought that that's what it meant to be a, an effective human being and be successful. And we now know that that one, we know now that 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 we used to think it was fixed. If you had an IQ and that was it, that's no longer the case. We now know that it's not a fixed capacity, that it's, it's, it's actually malleable. Um, uh, Daniel Goleman came along in 1995 and wrote a book called Emotional Intelligence. Now, he didn't invent emotional intelligence. There was a great deal of research that preceded that. Uh, Howard Gardner at Harvard was talking about multiple intelligences at that time. And, and it really became clear that to be successful in life requires a lot more than intellect. It requires a great deal of capacity to read people, to read ourselves, to empathize with others and the people you know, we always said, you know, hey, that person's got street smarts and they didn't go to school or anything, but boy, they know how to, to navigate relationships. Um, and, and, and that sort of ruled the roost in terms of the way we think about education and training the last, uh, say, 20, 25 years. But there's a whole new level of research, areas of research that are going on now on the brain and story. And, and I think that we have a thing called story intelligence. I call it SQ for short. And it has to do with our pension for creating and living within stories. And I think this is what's defining about us as human beings. And, and the more we understand that, 
uh, and the more we uh, apply it in our lives, I think the more we have capability of really uh, growing in some very interesting ways. And I think we need a new name. Uh, homo, homo sapiens doesn't work for, I think we need to be homo norari, you know, loosely translated storytelling human. Uh, and I think instead of, I think therefore I am, I story, therefore I am. And, uh, and I think it's a different way of thinking about what it means to be a human being. And the more we learn about ourselves as story creatures, um, I think the more we can understand how to be effective in the world. We can also understand some of the dysfunction in our world as well. We'll talk a little bit about that. So I think there's seven powers of story. I'll just, I'm gonna, we're going to spend our time mostly right there in the middle about creating meaning. Uh, but um, I think stories can transport us to other places in time, in the past and into the future. It's really interesting. The areas of our brain that we use for memory are also the areas of our brain that we use for envisioning possibilities. So I think that as we begin to develop our capacity as storytellers, we become better at envisioning the future we want to create. Uh, we know that story and communication go hand in hand. All of us know that we've had teachers who are great storytellers, and those are the teachers we remember. And uh, those who are very didactic, we can't even tell you what they taught us. But you can remember stories for sometimes 20, 30, 40 years that just stuck with us. Um, stories enable us to learn. I had a wonderful teacher, Paula Underwood, for a number of years, who was Native American out of the Oneida tradition. They did not have a word for teach within their language. The closest uh, kind of uh, 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 translation would be enabler of learning. And uh, they had a whole series of what they called learning stories. And, uh, and actually that product story care, which I talked about is one of the things I created in healthcare. It is built on this ancient tradition of enabling learning. And it's used in healthcare to actually help teams learn to be able to reduce uh, harm in hospitals. So. Uh, here's an ancient, ancient learning that I've been able to take and apply <laughs> in modern healthcare. We'll talk more about creating meaning. Uh, its cousin is to transform. And so we happen to have intractable problems. Uh, some of them are, are things that we've schlepped along from our past. And, and it's amazing if we understand how to use story, we can take things that are often very painful and difficult and turn them into often jewels uh, of the, of that can not only transform our life, but inform us, uh, inform us with a greater sense of purpose. Stories can bring us together. They can also tear us apart. And we have lots of evidence of that in our world today. And we look at uh, all of the conspiracy theories that are out there. Those are stories. And uh, try to convince somebody who has ingested that Kool-Aid that it's not true tough because it gets wired into the brain. So there's a saying that neurons that fire together wire together. If you tell the same story to yourself over and over again, only a few times, it gets wired in. That's why it's hard to change. That's why it's hard to change behave patterns of behavior. That's why it's hard to change beliefs because they literally do get wired in to our neural patterns of, of, uh, of functioning. And uh, so we won't spend time with that. We don't have time for that tonight. And the final one, which may be the most important one, is how do we envision a better life, a better world? And how do we create a better world? But we'll, we'll leave that for another night, Mark, uh, if people want to spend time. I'm working on a new book called Time Travel. And uh, it's about how do we go to the future and, and get there and, and create a better future. So some of you probably heard this story about Rebzusia, but I want to repeat it. Uh, if you haven't heard it, it's one of my favorite little tales. And Reb uh, Zussi of Hanapal was on his deathbed and he was crying and he was surrounded by his, uh, his faithful students and they were, they were heartbroken to see him in tears and they tried to reassure him that uh, certainly in the next life uh, there was going to be a place for him and they said, you know, Reb Zussi, you know, you've been, you, you've been as, uh, as, um, as, as kind as Abraham and as wise as Moses, certainly there will be a place for you in the next life. And do not, do not be afraid. Do not be sad. He says, that's not why I'm, I, I'm not really, I'm not really sad. I'm just really fearful. And they said, well, why? He says, well, I'm afraid that when I get to the next world, God will not ask me, Zeusia, why were you not more like Moses? Or Zeusia, why were you not more like Abraham? He'll say, Zeusia, 
how come you were not more like Zeus yet? And I think that is really the crux of uh, all of our lives and the challenge we have is how do we become more of who we are? How do we become, uh, uh, find and embrace um, our true story, our, our calling in life and, and live that with authenticity? And so that's what we're gonna be spending some time with tonight. Um, we've been trying to find, uh, find out what it means, what a meaningful life looks like. We've had lots of philosophers look at that issue. A lot of our religious traditions have attempted to tell us what meaning is uh, in life. And uh, one of the best definitions I've kind of, I found is, is ikigai, it comes from Japanese, and, 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 and loosely translated is that which gives us purpose and meaning in life. What is it that gives us a sense of purpose and meaning in life? And uh, so there's a lot to be learned from story and story traditions around that. So I think that each of us has what I call personal narrative assets. We have a whole body of assets that we have available that we've not mined, we've not, uh, we've not explored. And these are fundamental to who we are and they are, they are riches. We are sitting on a mountain of riches. And you know the old saying is that when a person dies, a library is burned to the ground. And so you know, part of uh, Hoff's you know, presentation was how do we preserve <laughs> our wisdom? And how do we pass it on in a way that's uh, meaningful for the next generations? And so how, how, do, how do we tap into these narrative assets? So um, there is a real connection between story and meaning. And there's three, there's lots of ways people have parsed this. Uh, I found these three as key pieces is that stories help us to find coherence, purpose, and significance. So I want to talk a little about each of those, and then we're going to do a little sharing with that. Um, so the first is coherence. So to understand that, I want to tell you a strange tale. And um, uh, I'm blanking out on his name. He wrote the book, uh, the, Souls, the Souls Code. He is a, a, a um, Jungian psychologist. I'll tell you what his name is in a second. Uh, but he, he tells a strange story about, uh, about identical twins in the research they did, and identical twins who were separated at birth and adopted. And so, you know, each of us tells stories about our life and try to explain why we are the way we are. You know, we had certain parents, and this is what it was like in our household, and this is why, that's why we've become the person we've become. And so here are two are children who were born and separated at birth. They're identical twins. And they uh, found them in their early teens and started and interviewed them and asked them, you know, a little bit about their lives. And in this one case, they were both neatniks, very, very fastidious. And, and they asked them, What's, how did you become such a neatnik? And the first child said, oh, uh, James Hillman is the author. The Souls Code that just came to me. He said, "Oh, oh, oh, oh you know, my my mother, uh, she is very fastidious. Everything is in its place here in the household, and you know, that's how I became such a neatnik." The second child they asked, "So how did you become such a neatnik?" He said, "Oh, my mother is a slob. Everything is a mess, and I just had to in my bedroom. And that's the only way I could find any kind of sense of peace was to at least have things organized in my bedroom where I had some control." And Hillman suggests that um, that we make up stories to explain ourselves, but we actually come into life already pre-wired. We already come in pre-wired, and there's a lot of uh, things that we bring into life that have nothing to do with our family <laughs> or our <laughs> of origin, but we make up stories that help to explain it. And so I want to talk a little bit, so I, this is a, what it would be called a constructivist theory of meaning, is that we construct meaning. And, and I think there's four kinds of global coherence that, um, that help us understand our lives. So the first of all is, is cultural, what I would call cultural context. We have a, sort of an expectation of what the arc of our life will look like. Is, you know, we'll, we'll be born, we'll, we'll go through uh, you know, teenage years, we'll grow up, uh, we'll maybe go to school, we'll, sep we'll, we'll leave home, we'll have a family, uh, and uh, we'll have a nice mature adulthood and then we'll get older and we'll retire and there's a sense of expectation of an arc and um and we we 
as long as our life is following along this, we have a sense of coherence, that things are, things are in place, they're the way they should be. But sometimes things happen in life that are unexpected. An illness occurs, and suddenly our narrative is disrupted and derailed. That was not part of the cultural expectations that at age 35, we were going to get cancer, you know, or perhaps we were trying to have children and we could not have children. And suddenly our identity, which is so tied up with this expectation of this arc of story is suddenly disrupted. And we have to, we have to forge a new identity, a new story. So um, that's, that's the first area of coherence. The other is we, we expect, to map our lives along uh, what I would call chronological sequence that we are expecting uh, that we tie our, our life experiences to big events that happen in our world. Right now, we're in the middle of one a pandemic. Kids growing up right now are going to look back on this time, and this will be a pivotal kind of touchstone for them. OK, and um, all of us have had different touchstones. So I, uh, and many of us are old enough to remember the day Martin Luther King was assassinated. Maybe the day Robert Kennedy, which was, who was assassinated just a few months after that, or certainly 9-11 when the planes flew into uh, to, uh, you know, the towers. Um, and, uh, and I know that I can, I can remember very clearly, you know, the day John Kennedy was shot. I was in seventh grade in my English class, and the headmaster of the school came and said, the president has been shot. I'm a Jewish kid. We were, I was an Episcopal prep school. We went down to the, uh, the hall, and, uh, and I, never, I never kneeled, but that day I got on those little, uh, that little pad there in front of my seat and got on my knees because it was such a, you know, this was uh, an incredible experience, and most of you are old enough to remember that. So we're, we're going to do a quick breakthrough. I'm going to give, we'll put you in, uh, in pairs and uh, give you a chance to share a time. You can choose a pivotal event in history that occurred and, and share where were you, what was going on, and how was that a defining moment in your life experience? So let me stop sharing. And I'm going to set up the breakthrough rooms. And we'll put you, let's see how many people that we have here. We've got. Uh, yeah, we have uh, 16 people, uh, 16 rooms, um, and including me. I I'm have, sorry. I have, sorry, I have to get off for another call. So don't include me. Sorry. Okay. okay. Take you out, Dan. Yeah. So, uh, and, uh, and Steve, you have your hand up? Yes. I, I you know, I, I, I've been listening to everything and it's very interesting, but. I, I was exposed to Hawaiian culture for many years while I was working there on, on the island. And they, 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 they have a phrase they use. They don't say, you know, Mark, come, come talk to me. Let, let's, you know, let's see what happened today. They, they say, hey, Mark, let's talk story. And, and, and that, that means, you know, come tell me what you've been up to. What's your day like? You know, instead of it being all this long drawn out thing it's just let's talk story and i i just thought that was kind of interesting that beautiful. it's ingrained in that culture yeah yeah so that's beautiful how, how it's just so integral to the way they think about themselves think about conversing etc so um so including let's see here one two three four five six was it one one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I'm gonna do set seven rooms. Okay. I can set this up. Uh, you want to set it up? Yeah. But don't put me in a room. Okay. Because I think that'll give everybody. And we'll give everybody, um, Mark, let's give everybody, let's give it like uh, four minutes. So two minutes each way to share. And then we'll bring back and, and do some uh, sharing out with the larger group. How's that sound? That sounds like, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I was looking at the, <laughs> how many minutes? Uh, we're going to go for about four minutes. Okay. Two minutes each way. So if you guys can kind of track your time, uh, just a quick sharing of uh, an event uh, that historically happened, and what, where were you? How was it? How did it impact your life? Okay, no travel and music, for my friends. It's going to be tough without it, but I guess we'll have to.
for Wait, minutes. Are you going in a room? Yes, I am. Okay. Okay. How are you? I'm uh, <laughs> fair to Midland. Is uh, Rabbi Mark with us also? Can you hear each it other? Looks like it. Yes, we yeah. do. Why am I not? <laughs> <laughs> you got to get with the technology. Come on. Yeah, I guess he can't hear us, though. <laughs> no, we heard him. Right. Okay, let's, let's get into it. Okay. So what do you remember? Uh, I remember when Kennedy was killed. Um, I, I'm a native Washingtonian, and I was editor of my undergraduate newspaper mm. at Howard University. Mm. So I was at my printers on, are you, do you know DC? A little bit. Okay, anyway, I was on U Street, and this guy came in and said, the president's been shot. And I thought, why would someone want to kill President Nabrit, who's president of, you know, Howard at the time? And then I th thought, what the heck? And I had already designed the first page of the newspaper. This was the old linotype, you know, these machines with, mm -hmm. with lead uh, letters, and not the electronic at all. And I would set up the page with... Uh, columns of paper and paste them onto a larger sheet. Anyway, then it, uh, I discovered it was Kennedy and uh, the previous editor who I th was one of my heroes, he said, Mel, I'm gonna write a front page editorial. So I have a copy of that issue of the newspaper with the headline, Kennedy gone. Now, um, I don't think I wrote that headline, but nevertheless, uh, that was a, vivid memory, and then we had uh, different ceremonies to honor Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's my story. I'm done. Thank you, Mel. Good to hear your voice. Well, we heard you, Mark. You didn't hear us. <laughs> Did you go already, Gail? No, I hadn't. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, from a historical point of view, I mean, I certainly probably the first memory was Kennedy. Also, I was in seventh grade and in math class, and um, oh, you're a mere child. <laughs> Mr. Coyle was um, the math teacher, and they announced it over the PA system, and I just remember how quiet everything got, and nobody knew what to do, um, and. Uh, they reported additional facts, but we basically just sat there and it was, I think it was seventh period. So after that was school was done because I think it was around two, two thirty or something. And um, yeah. And so I, for me, it was like, I think it was the first sense of, um, you know, that things really aren't always safe in the United States that had been that people can, you know, assassinate uh, presidents. Of course, I knew that Abraham Lincoln was too, but yeah, so it, it definitely changed things from a, it, it was almost like a growing up kind of knowledge that, um, okay. And, and then of course that went on because over Thanksgiving then when um, Jack Ruby shot, um, um, what was this? Uh, <laughs> <Drake. laughs> Yeah. Lee Harvey Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah. Oh my God, that's bad. Um, Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah. I mean, we were at Thanksgiving dinner and the TV was on, and it, I think it happened right then or something. So, yeah, that whole holiday and yeah, just a very somber time is what I remember. Well, if I may, in the minute I think that we have left, over twenty nine seconds we have left. Go ahead. Go for it. A, a bit of history that had a major impact on my life was in 1960 when Bill Mazeroski hit a home run for the Pittsburgh Pirates to beat my beloved New York Yankees in the last inning of the seventh game of the World Series. Mm. Um, my clearest memory from that was um, afterwards going downtown to uh, in New York City to my father's shop and weeping. Oh, well, we were cheering it. We here's coming back. <laughs> No, you'll have to apologize. I'm sorry, Alf, I apologize. 
No, welcome back. I know that was a pretty <laughs> these this isn't like the breakthrough rooms on Saturday mornings, but because uh, we don't have that much time. But um, uh, anybody want to quickly uh, share uh, something that came up for them that was maybe a surprise or a connection point? Uh, uh, Steve, you said you did you raise your hand? Yeah. OK, I, I uh, my, when I was uh, sharing was the uh, the uh, second space shuttle um, crash. I was working for Boeing. I was working at Rocketdyne and then and, and supporting folks at Johnson Space Center and Kennedy at the time. And I was excited that there was an Israeli astronaut on there. And and I got up very early. I was at a conference the week before it was supposed to land. And that weekend when it was uh, coming in for its landing, I got up at about 2.33 in the morning to watch it streak over Sedona, Arizona on its flight path into Kennedy and saw it go by and, and went back to sleep and got a wake up call from my aunt who called me to ask me if I heard what happened. And I didn't believe it I, until I saw it on the news. And uh, I, I was wearing the mission pin on my jacket and had a, another one on my hat. And it was, it was very touching and sad to, 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 to you know, see the beginning, the liftoff, and, and then um, see the last time when it was probably as a complete shuttle go by. Yeah, tra it was, uh, tragedy. It hard for was, quite a while. I was, I was on the 17th floor of a building in downtown Orlando when the first shuttle flew up off of the uh, pad and you could just see it there in the sky, you know, cause it was, you know, it was just, um, Mary Rita, you had something. Yes, I, I, I shared also about the first shuttle, the Challenger, cause I was a student at Catholic university and I was in the bookstore and heard that. And it made me remember how from the time I was a little kid following each of the space flights but this one, I, I, um, I, I really remembered because of Krista McAuliffe. And then my partner in my, in, in my dyad talked about 9-11. And what I remember more about that was the aftermath of the National Guard, like standing on the corner outside my office and the effect that it had in some of my clients when they came in, every when they saw the, in a sense, the military presence after with afterwards, it was uh, really terrifying for a lot of my clients and also for me. You never knew what you were going to get into when you like tried to get on the metro. Right. So um, you know, we, we we could spend a lot of time, you know, kind of processing these, but uh, what I want to introduce you to is the idea is that this is a a, a a vehicle or avenue by which you can begin to look back on your life. You can start to look at some of these historical events. And just like in the first part of uh, coherence is you can look at, you can look at that arc of your life and, and, the, and where have the disruptions been and, and that have sort of derailed and, and how you had to readjust and rethink your life story and, and create a new story that uh, they would provide you with meaning. Um, any last uh, kind of reflection before we move on to uh, the next level of coherence? Um, so I know this is a whirlwind. Yes, uh, Deborah. I just wanted to say, as the only Canadian in this group, mm. I remember all those American things that happened. And it's only once we reconvened and I started sitting back and going, oh, wait a minute, what about in Canada? And I could start thinking of things because the American presence is so great. And those events were so significant. Yeah, but if you were, you know, in Africa or South America or or Europe, uh, you would have a very different take on these things because you've got, to, you know, in Canada, yeah, but, I mean, there are lots of things that happened in Canada, you know, that, that have not affected us. Hoff, you had something. You're still on mute, Hoff. Yeah, what, not a specific thing, but generically what i note is that things that happen that create those stories shatter or change or alter 
my normal expectations that I have about the way life is going to be. And these stories put me into a different place. They yeah. put me into a place of, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm jarred because it's not what I expected to happen in my life. Right. And I think that what this is about is that, is that we are on a journey and suddenly uh, an event takes us to a new journey and we can fight it. <laughs> uh, we can be angry about it and maybe sometimes for good reason, uh, but we also can embrace it and say, well, where is this taking me? This is not what I expected. This, yeah, Mark. Yeah, I just want to quickly um, remind myself that um, reading Torah is a is the is the way we remember the way we put things back together into a story in which we can see ourselves in and so listening to other people relate stories in our breakthrough room of things that i remember as well helps me to um to place myself in a much larger story as well as my own and 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 helps to create the connections necessary that you were talking uh, about before rick of what stories can do to bring us together or to break us apart that's right and these are these are what i call meta narratives i think torah is a meta narrative and uh and it, it it allows us to to discover our own personal narrative as it can do that if, if we if we enter into it in the right way i think so let me share my screen one more time here we go so we will move on so there's another uh, another way of looking at our life stories and that is through the concept of agency um when we have a sense of agency in our life, we tend to feel our life is meaningful. But if someone else is making all the decisions for us and we have no agency, we tend to feel a sense of discord. And so you can begin to look at, uh, you know, maybe even at your life at times where you felt a great sense of agency and maybe at other times where uh, for whatever reason or in whatever circumstance, maybe you worked in a situation where, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't speak what <laughs> the truth um, and, and your agency is taken away. And, and, and that creates, I think, a deep discord for us. So, um, and I'm thinking of younger people, the more we can give them a sense of agency in their life, uh, the more they can find meaning and purpose. Um, and then the fourth is what I would call global thematic coherence. And that has to do with connecting our early experiences with who we are today. Um, so, you know, uh, if, if you as a young person used to love to fiddle and take apart watches, and then you became a, a, an engineer, Steve, I don't know if you had that experience, uh, or, you know, you used to be what you're interested in how things worked. And you would take them apart, you know, and then, you know, and then you suddenly go, oh, that's how I became an engineer. So I can suddenly trace back my experience today with where I was as a child. And so um, and we're going to so I thought we would we would do a, a, a quick another breakthrough room here. And and, and look at if you can tie uh, the present or your more near present. Uh, to your past because of X early in my life, that's what led to me being who I am today. You got that? So the idea is to share is, is to connect uh, something that, that was uh, going on earlier that um, that actually pre uh, almost sort of um, pre, pre, pre sort of predetermined the, 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 the path you've taken to today. So, so let's try that, Mark. If we can, uh, I'll stop share again here. If if we can throw, we're, you we're ready to go. Yeah, let's just go ahead and put people. We'll go for about another four or five minutes. I'll give you a message about midway, and and Shulamit, don't leave your partner hanging. Uh, you know, when I give you the the break the, at the end of the break, <laughs> you have thirty seconds more. So I'll try. I'll, I'll keep time. So okay, okay, and you'll close the rooms, Rick. Okay. I'll close the room. Now. Okay, yeah, here we go.
Well, you know, did somebody? Uh, everybody's in twos, and um, oh, so did we lose somebody? No, uh, yeah, somebody left. Oh, somebody left. Okay, uh, and I'm and and I'm not going to go. Okay, so, so why you you and I can. Yeah, we can. Okay. So two two um, events that um, tie things together in our lives. Yeah, something you know for early that uh, early in your life that sort of uh, you can go. Oh, so that's how I've become the human being I've become today. Yeah. There's so many. Mm-hmm. So here's one. Um, when I um, was working on my graduate degree, um, I was offered a position um, at the campus school that was associated with the university that I was at um, <clears throat> after I was done to work at the school. And uh, it would be my first job after college. Um, and the music teacher had retired, and they went for my idea to create a joint music and theater program. Now, at the same time, I still was very much involved in, um, in the theater world and um, always looking for just my, uh, keeping my eyes out for things that were happening and just kept the hand in on what was going on. on uh, and in the trade magazines like show business and backstage and and one trip to the city when i say the city of course i mean new york because uh, I'm, I'm from yonkers close to that i picked up copies of both of them and i'm and i brought them back home to uh to my house in new paltz new york which is where i went to school and um, i'm looking through the paper and i find a ad uh, for um a a theater company in Washington, D.C. looking for a music director. It's a theater company that's out to change the world using theater. And I looked up at the woman who would then be my wife to a a couple of years after that. And I said, they're looking for me. Now, that's not the end of the story. (laughs) How are we doing on time? Uh, Probably got another. You have another. I need to give people a. uh, Yeah, give them a warning. Go ahead. I'll just tell them to change. Uh, I know about that. This is uh, this is how I spend my time. Time to switch sharing. Okay. All right. I'll go I'll quick. And um, I came down to Washington D.C. I auditioned actually in the spring and then again in the fall. I was offered the job and I wasn't sure which one to take because I already had a job. I was a we'd be a little fish in a, a big fish in a little pond. And we were, I was with a number of people, um, uh, elders of mine who I was in a summer theater with, uh, who taught in um, in the public schools and the, and the campus school. And I told them about my just difficulty in making a decision. What do I do? Do I take this job here at the uh, with the campus school or do I move to Washington? And Bob Casper looks at me and he says, Mark, let me get this straight. You're trying to decide between staying in New Paul, starting a new program in which you're going to be meeting with approximately 200 kids a week, having to come up with six or seven lessons plans a day and working with an administration that may or may not have your back or move to Washington, D.C. to work with a group of theater artists who are looking to change the world. I don't quite see what the <laughs> what the issue is. Oh, <laughs> so yeah, it's like oh, yeah. Yeah. really? This one, you know, like, yeah. you know see that this is. Look at this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, it's a much longer story, but yeah, I thought I'd give you at least thirty seconds to tell yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. Um, gosh, you know, I, I was just thinking. I used to go with my mother was in community theater. And I used to go and watch her rehearse when I was a pretty, I was probably four or five years old. And, um, and that was, I think, you know, you know, now, now I think of, you know, the, my embarking on becoming a storyteller, dropping out of graduate school to do that. Hmm. Um, uh, when I dropped out of graduate, they're selling my company and going into that. And uh, but at one point, I just when I was in graduate school in psychology, I started going to a local theater and and took some workshops and then started getting roles. 
and and was even like thought i love this maybe i should go to new york <laughs> you know and i was really thinking about leaving to go to new york to find my fame and fortune in acting and then, you know and it was too scary <laughs> but it took it took a while for it finally to circle back mm -hmm. and uh and you know i decided to embark on a career in storytelling which my I, I remember having dinner with my father and he looked at me like i had just like lost my mind <laughs> you're going to sell your ad agency to do what you know <laughs> it was a disbelief but i said i just have to do this i mean it was really it was really compelling so let me let me tell people to close the rooms I'm closing okay the rooms. um so well look how much we can get done how much story we can tell in five four or five minutes that's right yeah i mean this is i mean this could be an all-day workshop you know we could do the whole thing with this yeah absolutely yeah and um so you, I'm sure you're uh, mindful of time. Yes, I am. I'm watching time. Great. So I don't think we'll do. We may not do another breakout room. I may skip the, the last one. We'll see. We'll see how we're doing. So welcome back, all of you, and uh, and so I'm wondering. Um, what kinds of interesting connections did you make? Uh, we have time maybe to hear from a couple of you, perhaps a couple we haven't heard from. If you feel adventurous to share, um, what kinds of uh, connections did you make to your early life to see how that um, in some ways uh, foretold the person you've become? Yes, uh, Carol Ann. Yeah, you're muted. Unmute, yeah. Um, well, I was sharing uh, with Mel that when I was about 10 years old, I started a day camp in the Catskills, uh, where my parents took me to spend the summers. And, um, and later in life, um, I became an entrepreneur and started my own consulting service. My mother was a teacher, and I was supposed to be a teacher, and I did teach for quite a few years. But the entrepreneurial spirit, including my father's influence as a businessman, brought me to my own business extremely comfortably and confidential, confidently, which was amazing. Yeah. So you had the confidence as a, as, a, as a young kid to create your own day camp. I know. I went around and got money from all the, uh, the housewives that are down at the, at the colony. Oh, my gosh. Went into town and bought the supplies, and, uh, and the owner of the bungalow colony gave me the, 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 the casino which was the social hall, and let me run a day camp during the day for three hours in the morning. I had, I planned the whole thing. Amazing. Yeah. So look at the end. Yeah. So that, that was nascent and that, that spark was waiting to be reignited as you be in your later life. Thank you for sharing. Wonderful. Someone else, anybody else? One other person want to. Anna, Anna. Anna has her light, her hand up. Anna. 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 Oh, good. Good. Sorry. Thank you. Anna. Yes. Thank, thanks for having me. Yeah, I broke my arm in the third grade, and from then on, I wanted to be a doctor. I got to college and said I can't compete with all those brains, and I ended up getting a secondary teaching credential. When I was a senior in college, I had the opportunity to go work for an Army intelligence agency for the summer. I went back the following summer, and I ended up staying full time. So what I ended up doing was... Uh, writing a lot of studies, anything from small articles to big blown almost books, and also giving briefings from to a, a small audience, maybe with a general with his staff, or to audiences of 500 people. I was teaching. And when I retired, I was looking at another occupation. And I had been thinking for a few years before that of going into massage. So I retired to go to massage class, became a massage therapist, and became the healer that I had wanted to be from the time I was third grade. Beautiful, beautiful. So it's just beautiful. Yeah, so what a, what a beautiful arc to that story. So thank you for sharing. So um, I appreciate your sharing. Let's, I've got a couple, a few more things I want to share with you. So let me share my screen again, if I could. Uh, there we go. And um, so um, 
So there's also a question about uh, does our st does our st do we stay the same or do we change over time? And it, there's really interesting research on this. Some of, some people think of themselves as sort of enduring, and, and they haven't changed since their childhood. And and some people think that they they're not they, you know they're not even close to being the person they were when they were a kid. And I don't know uh, you know where you are on that. Maybe we could we could do a, see a show of hands. How how many of you think that you've been that you're the same person you you've always been and 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 there's not and sort of you've been sort of stable through all that time. Maybe see a, 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 raise your hand. Okay, you've got one, uh, you've got two, yeah, three. Yeah, I see maybe yeah. So uh, how many of you? Although, think you, you although need to Rick, do? I think there's yeah. nuance to that. Answer. Of course, <laughs> there is nuance. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, so but uh, but how many think you've, you've radically changed with time and you show up differently in various contexts of your life? So yeah, so that's another way of thinking about our life is just to also look at is that who were we then and who have we become and 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 maybe we're we've become a whole different kind of person and maybe we've recreated our life and. Maybe multiple times, you you know, you've you've gone through iterations of recreation, and I, I can look at that myself. And certainly professionally, I've done that. Um, so real quickly, we've got a few more minutes left. I, I want to talk about different kinds of reminiscence, um, which I think are, are 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 can be valuable for you in terms of thinking about how how do we begin to reflect on our life. And uh, there's what I would call simple reminiscence. So. You know, when I turned 16, my grandfather, uh, he had dementia. And uh, he had a Ford Fairlane car that was a few years old. And, uh, and he couldn't drive it. He, was, he had his, he, my dad took him to the court after he'd had multiple accidents. And the judge says, uh, Mr. Lindenbaum, how old are you? And he said, oh, 55. <laughs> of course, he wasn't 50. He lied. Because <laughs> he knew that you knew that, that this was not good. And so I got his car and my father got it painted metallic blue. And it was pretty close to this color and it was a hot car, but it didn't have a radio. So I had, when I went on dates, I'd have to get uh, uh, my own little transistor radio and stick it on the dashboard, you know, <laughs> so I could play music. Uh, but it, it was a car and, and it gave me wheels and it was, you know, gave me mobility. So that's what I call simple reminiscence. And we get together all the time, you know, over a glass of wine or whatever, and we tell stories. And there is great value in these stories, even though they're simple. They remind us of, a, of a, an earlier time. And there's an old saying, the body doesn't know the difference between a real event and an imagined one. And when we're reimagining something that happened in the past that was a fond memory, it is as though it's as bathing our, our physiology with all the good feelings that were associated with that. And, uh, so what's interesting about this is that I created this program called Living Stories based on some research that was done a number of years ago uh, by a guy named Bruce, uh, Bruce Rabarjic. And uh, we uh, trained volunteers to go into hospital rooms to interview patients. And there were two kinds of stories that we, we looked to them to collect. One were just simple reminiscence, fond memories, okay? And, uh, and they found the research showed that the, their anxiety levels were reduced and also their, their scores on, on, on a, an assessment that looked at resilience went up, which is really interesting. And the other kind of story that we, we taught them to, to elicit would be what I would call instrumental reminiscence. And what instrumental reminiscence is remembering a time where we faced a challenge in the past and we were successful at getting through it. And it turns out that these stories of instrumental reminiscence are really crucial for our mental health. There's a great deal of research that shows that uh, people who are getting into their 60s and 70s and even 80s who spend time recalling times of resilience, of, of, of doing well in other things, uh, tend to be uh, happier people. They need less medication. They're less depressed. Uh, they, they tend to re, uh, rebound more quickly from illness. So uh, spending time remembering times of mastery is really valuable. And we don't have time. We, we, I was going to do a, a, a sharing, and we're going to skip that because we're kind of tight on time here tonight. Um, so there's, there's two other kinds of, of, of life narrative that are really important. And Hoff uh, talked a little bit about one of those, and this is what I call transmissive reminiscence. 
And Hoff talked a little bit about ethical wills. That is a way of transmitting to another person in our life, a younger person, um, the lessons that we've learned from our life experiences. And so a lot of the stories we tell as we get older, especially to other younger generations, or if even if you're still working and you have somebody you're mentoring, and the best way to teaching them is through, is through stories. Let me tell you about a similar time when I faced a challenge like that, and that is transmissive reminiscence, and I think we have a fundamental need for that. Um, the last form is what I would call integrative reminiscence. If we think of our life as a, as, a, as a book with chapters, have we included every chapter? And when I was first doing work with story many, many years ago, I was teaching in a uh, elder hostel, which has now become, uh, uh, they changed the whole brand for that. It's now called- uh, Road Scholar. Road Scholars, yeah, thank you. And, uh, and I, had, I had some older people there uh, some of whom who had uh, got, gone through the war, some who had uh, probably were survivors of the Holocaust. And, and often, you know, I would hear from them, well, I don't want to remember the old, the old, the old country, or, you know, that you know, we've left that behind. That was a bad chapter. I don't even want to talk about that. But the truth is there's great value in seeing that because we wouldn't be who we are if we had not often gone through that difficulty. And so uh, how do we include everything in the chapter so that it is an integrated whole? Um, there's a thing called autobiographical reasoning, seeing our life as a biography, which is really crucial. And uh, there's a couple researchers here at Emory that I've gotten to know uh, pretty well, both Jewish, by the way, I don't know what that, that has any bearing on it, but they've been, they've been studying uh, intergenerational storytelling for 30 years. And they've been looking at the impact it has on younger generations. And it turns out that children who know their family stories, it is the best predictor of them having resilience and high self-esteem. There is no better predictor of that. And think about it. We're born into a story that's already left the station. You know, it's, it's a story in progress. We don't have any real stories ourselves. So all we have is the stories that, that are, we're swimming in in our families. And if we hear stories about tough times and how we got through difficult times, those become our stories. And so when we face difficulty, we have those to draw upon. And hopefully as we get older, then we, we've gone through our own challenges in life. And now we can look back and go, you know, I got through that, I can get through this. And I think that what young people are missing today often is, uh, is that they don't know the stories. And so when they face difficulty, they don't have a story to, to draw upon, a story that's a touchstone for them. And then life feels somehow like there's no possibilities. They don't have that connection. Uh, I have a friend who, uh, whose parents fought in the resi uh, resistance. Uh, they were Jewish during World War II and he's had cancer. And, and he said, you know, I often think about my parents. They got through that. I can get through this. So it's once again that, you know, it's not, you don't have to be a young person for that. Uh, there's a little a wonderful scale called the Do You Know scale, which they have developed. Uh, there's lots of questions, you know, do you know the names of the schools your mom went to or, do you know, uh, you know, where, where they were born? These are proxy questions. They're not, you know, it's not like they're like, these are the questions, but they found that these are pretty good. And the more uh, young people can answer yes to these, uh, the more likely they know the family stories. Uh, this is available, uh, you can, if you go to storyintelligence.com, maybe uh, Mark, you can put that in the chat. Um, there's a lot of resources, but this is one of the resources and you can download this and print it out. So finally, I wanna take just a minute or two, I wanna talk to you about uh, significance and uh, purpose. So I, I believe uh, that that we have within us a deep calling. And part of our life journey is about discovering what is it we're called to do. And it shows up sometimes in, in you know, very apparent ways, and we know it very early on that we're called. And sometimes it's like this, uh, this little wonderful quote from Elizabeth Gilbert, it's buried deep within us. And we have to, we have to see, we have to do some digging to find it. Um, and so a lot of my work over the last few years is about helping people discover what is that deep calling? So I thought we would finish 
with a wonderful story. I've got a little piece of video that I wanna share with you. Um, and let me be sure that, that the, I've got sharing with sound. Hold on. Um, yep, I do. Okay, so I'm gonna share this, uh, which is about that. And then we'll, 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 we'll wrap up with that. So um, let me go to the video and here we'll play it. Many years ago in Thailand, there was a temple that was called the Temple of the Golden Buddha. And there was a huge statue of the Golden Buddha. And word came to this village where the monastery was that an army from a neighboring country was about to invade. And they got the brilliant scheme to cover the Golden Buddha, which is quite large, with mud and concrete so that it looked basically like a stone Buddha and they, the army would perceive no value in it. And sure enough, this army rolled in with its caissons and weapons. And as they passed by the monastery, they saw nothing but a big stone Buddha, and they had no reason to plunder it. Well, years went by because the army continued to occupy it, until there was a time in the monastery in the village when no one remembered that the Buddha was golden, until one day a young monk was sitting on the Buddha meditating on his knee, and as he got up, a little piece of concrete happened to crack off and he saw something shiny. He realized there was gold under there. And so he ran to his fellow monks and said, the Buddha's golden, the Buddha's golden. They all came out and they realized he was telling the truth and they took their picks and, and hammers and eventually they unearthed the golden Buddha. Now what's the metaphor here? The metaphor is that each of us is golden Gold by, nature. by nature. We were born golden, we were born high, we were born knowing, we were born connected to our bliss, we were born knowing truth, we were born knowing everything that every great spiritual master has ever said. We were one with the Christ, the Buddha, everyone. But then we went to school and they said, you have to dress like this, and this is what boys do, and this is what girls do, this is what black people do, this is what white people do, on and on and on. And so we developed a casing of stone over the Buddha to a point where at a young age, maybe four or five, six or seven, we believed that we were the stone Buddha, not the golden one. And then something comes along that cracks our casing. Maybe it's an injury, a divorce, a financial setback, a governmental change, something that really scares us and bugs us and knocks off a piece of our, our armor. And only in that moment of the armor being knocked off do you get to look inside and see the gold. And let me tell you, friend, that the moment you see that gold, the armor and the concrete will never satisfy you again. At that point, you truly enter the true hero's adventure. Sure. And all you want to do for the rest of your life is pick away the stone because the gold is so much more fun. <laughs> yeah. So... Um... So I'm, I'm going to stop share right there. I, I know that uh, Mark wants to do uh, the own county of the Omar, but we'll take maybe a minute or two and see. Uh, uh, so, you know, a lot of the work that that I have done has been focused in the last couple of years is how to lead people to discover what is that gold? What is, what is that fundamental thing that's underneath there? And once you have that, I call that your master story, then that becomes the litmus test for all decisions, for, for how, how we make decisions and what's valuable and what's important and the things that we do and the things that we say, that's not for me, you know, wonderful thing to do, but that's not for me because I'm, this is what I'm called to do. So I'll pause there, Mark, and, uh, and how much long, how long do you need for the Omar about that? Well, uh, uh, how about um, you take a couple of, uh, comments or questions and then we'll, do and then, um, we'll count the omer and um, actually i have something to tie together with everything that you've been talking about rick I'm happy to stick around a little bit uh, 
you know, to, yeah. Right. So, Carol, Carol Ann, you had, a, you had a comment, yeah. You're on, you're on mute. Yeah. You're still on mute, Carol Ann. Carol Ann, you're on mute. Uh, what are number six and number seven of uh, the list um, of, of seven, seven powers of story? I missed it. So the six, the six power stories to unite and the seventh power is to envision possibilities. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Deborah. This is going to sound like a really um, dumb question, but I would just like to know, based on the algorithm of Zoom, how many people had the same partners in their breakthrough rooms both times? Okay, so two out of seven. Okay, thank you. It was, as, what, as my friend Heidi Schleifer would say, it was the kosher choreographer managing all these relationships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, uh, yes uh, Hoff. Hey, Richard, I wanted to um, give a slightly different aspect of story, which is I take great relish in creating story with my grandchildren. We make up and I write down a made up story with usually some sort of cockamamie moral at the end of the story. Beautiful. And I find that very uh, gratifying and hopefully that'll be as memorable to them as a real story because the story is us making the story. That's right. And so the, just the joy of, of exercising imagination. I had an elder person tell me in one of these workshops I was doing at Elder Hostel, he said, you know, I used to tell my kids a story about Joe Pafufnik and his friend uh, Joe Fabitz and, and, and their girl, his girlfriend Molly Begonia. And, uh, and, and, and he said, you ever want to use it? And he had drawn them out and everything. And I ended up creating a whole thing. And when I was first started getting involved with storytelling, telling and Joe Fabitz, uh, Joe Joe Pafufnik was a baker and it was a whole story about baking up stories, you know? And so, yeah, so that's great fun. Uh, yeah, so uh, Mel, Mel, quickly, yeah. You're on, you're yeah. still on mute, there we go. I thought your presentation was really excellent and profound and I could think of a hundred people I'd like to share it with. Since it was recorded, how can I do that? So it will be uh, in the, um, it'll be on YouTube. It, it, Jump in the Mosh Pit is where you'll find it. And it's, it'll also be found in the link in the next email that goes out. So you can, that, is, that says a link to the recording of uh, Rick's presentation. And then you can click on that. And then you'll have the link that um, this recording will be at, that would not have been recorded except for the fine graces of Deborah Lesk. <laughs> <laughs> so with that note, I'm going to end the recording. <laughs>